want to deal with a topic tonight that is very, very important. This topic is going to be controversial in the sense that it is more so a reality of where we are than an indictment against us in fact. When some look at that statement, they may say that you know, people are making accusations. They're trying to, to, try to bring down or try to make a, a negative statement toward individuals. But brothers and sisters, the manifest evidence, the fruit that we see in our world today, especially in our church, are, is causing us, as we said in our opening statements, to see and believe that we are in the death throes of a denomination. The death throes, that we are gasping for air. We are on the verge of giving our last breath. And it seemed as if the church is about to fall, as it said in the books like the messages we've read many times. What are we seeing among us when we see the fruit that we've seen even this week, here in October, where the North American division, in connection with Andrews Seminary or University Seminary, the theology department of Andrews, the Biblical Research Institute, the bodies of North American Adventism have come together, especially at the, the premier university for the training and sending forth of Adventist ministers, their theology department has approved and voted a document, 21 page document dealing with the subject of homosexuality and giving a guideline or a blueprint or a, a suggested roadmap theologically and even practically for ministers to follow when it comes to dealing with homosexuals that are coming to Christ, no underscore of that, coming to Christ in the means of coming to Adventist churches. In this 21 page document, the writers and compilers of this document in 21 pages seek to unsettle what Jesus Christ did in the seven days of creation. 21 days, God could have made three worlds. In 21 pages, they seek to undo the creation order that God took seven days of his own time patiently to establish that we may have in Genesis a beginning both the first shall be last and the last shall be first. But according to these compilers, the first has no bearing to the last. And the last is more important than anything that is said in the first. In these 21 pages, not only is God's idea unsettled, now some would say that God's idea is settled because the first part of this two-part study, 21 pages but two parts, the first part seeks to make the, the case or attempts to affirm God's denunciation of homosexuality in act and practice. In act and practice. They are making the statements and they're looking at scripture that deal with God's denunciation of homosexuality, but their context, the way that they open up this document, they are making it seem or they want you to believe that their statement is dealing with the act and the practice of homosexuality. So in other words, what God says, what God means, God's ideal is to them narrowed down and not to be included, but narrowed down to the act or practice of homosexuality. Because they want to in one part affirm and clearly not try to deny anything that God says in his denunciation of homosexuality and the act of homosexuality. But in the second part, they then commence to create affirmation and apathy of the identity and orientation of homosexuality. And the subtle reader, the casual reader, might in this theological soup of, let's be kind, new theologians, the subtle reader will see this idea of Apathy and affirmation for the identity and orientation of homosexuality as not destroying or going against or hating the sinner, just hating the sin. Brothers and sisters, the sin is not just the act. The sin is not just, God does not just hate the sin of murder or the sin of anger or the sin of thievery or robbing. God hates the propensity and also he hates the very, very identity of it. He hates the very thing. He loves the individual, the sinner, the person. But he, by his gospel, he tells us the gospel that we believe, the everlasting gospel, which we have lost as a denomination and especially as a North American division, the gospel teaches that God can separate 
the sin and propensity and the identity from the individual. What does the Bible mean when we say we're born again? Born how? Again. Born again. First John says that we're born again. Is this legal? Is it a make-believe? Is this Buddhism? Are we just talking about platitudes? Are we talking about a, a way of thinking or a, 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 a type of mantra that we go through? Or is there very power in the gospel? I would suggest to you that this document is attempting to try to build a foundation in God's denunciation of homosexuality and make a context for it, make a new context for it, where this is just dealing with the act or the practice of homosexuality. But God loved the sinner. Yes, God's the sinner. But when you, in a skillful way, try to connect the sinner and the propensity and the identity, that's not the everlasting gospel. That's the evangelical gospel. The evangelical gospel believes that there's no real true removal of sin, that the flesh itself and what the flesh is, is sin. That's the evangel evangelical gospel. That's the gospel of the fallen churches. That's why Babylon must be departed from. These evangelical churches, these Sunday churches, these churches that have fallen since 1844, they have held to this type of gospel. And because of that and other kindred areas that flow from this false gospel, they have come to a fallen state. And we are not to be a sister to the fallen churches of Babylon because the Adventist church is not to be both by keeping the true day of worship and also understanding the true idea of the state of the dead. They are not to be nor can be in that sense Babylon. Oh, no, no. But brothers and sisters, this document is complete confusion, complete and utter confusion to try and make a case against homosexuality and act and then try to affirm and make a case of, of sympathy or even apathy for the identity and orientation. Oh, what skillful, what skillful deception is this? What skillful deception is this? Because some will again, in subtle reading or casual reading, think that we are not hating the sinner, we're just hating the sin. Oh, brothers and we can't separate. We can't separate what God has not separated and try to put together what God has put asunder. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is an amazing, amazing revelation that the individual that put this gospel uh, together here, this gospel of the new century, don't understand the everlasting gospel. The gospel that they speak of in this passage or these 21 pages is not the gospel that the Holy Spirit gave in these last days ever since the 1840s. Not this gospel that has been rising out of the East in Revelation 7 and coming to see the people of God. Not the same gospel. Not, can't be. Can't be. They go on and they make mention as they lay this foundation of this idea that the sinner and the identity are one and that they almost basically deny the fact that there is a born again experience and there is a washing and regeneration and a new creature. We'll deal with that. They come and they present this idea that these individuals that are given by birth this identity. Well, basically put it in this way. They say something to the effect of. They have heard, it almost makes it seem as if it's a rumor they heard. They mention a study and say they have heard that there were some. What the word I use? Some. There were some who seem, and the word is used, miraculously delivered from homosexuality. And this deliverance, miraculous now they say it, is so in to total that they don't struggle or have uh, 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 inner passions and desires toward homosexuality. They call that miraculous and they see they said some experienced this and then they go on to try and make clear first they talk about this like a rumor and that's the other part they make certain that there are many Christians that are struggling for all their lives with this propensity this identity they make, a, a, make a, a, a pretext now to say that this idea of the identity of homosexuality is Uneffaceable. This identity of homosexuality is what we were made with. And we can cease from the act by God's power. But the idea of being completely victorious is miraculous. It's almost like hocus pocus. But is that not one of the greatest admissions that your gospel is impotent? Isn't that one of the greatest admissions that the gospel that you preach does not have the power to deliver from sin? The reality of it is when we look at this idea, even the idea of embracing homosexuality, the NAD, the LGBT, and the idea of a lost gospel. We're dealing with the lost gospel, brothers and sisters. Homosexuality is just the symptom we're dealing with tonight and this idea of this, this document coming and trying to make a, a roadmap 
to entering into the embracing of homosexuality. That's what it is, because they don't deny what God says about the act of homosexuality, but they're making a theological roadmap to the embracing of the identity and orientation of homosexuality. That you can be a homosexual and be born again. You're just not going to practice homosexuality. In other words, God hates the act, but the very propensities, God cannot deliver you from that. We've heard some rumors of somebody being delivered from that, but the majority of the people, the majority of these Christians, they struggle all their life because our gospel can't do that. We've heard of some people that experience some of that, but we, the, the gospel that we know of doesn't do that. So we need to really affirm these people and make them know that they are both welcome in the churches of God, they must be made to feel welcome and praise God for anyone feeling welcome to come in and hear the gospel. But what gospel are they hearing? A gospel that cannot liberate them from the very issue that would cause them to die in the lake of fire. And the preachers that are preaching that are so similarly dispossessed of gospel power, they are the lost preaching to the lost. They don't know how to keep their heterosexual desires under control. So how can they teach a homosexual to keep his under control? Mm. It's one man that's impotent trying to take another man that's impotent to go out and make some children. Brother, sister, you can't do it. Sister, are you able to really do the work that God, in a spiritual context, is asking you to do as a minister if your <coughs> gospel is impotent? They talk about this idea of deliverance as, as a miraculous thing and thereby these individuals are truly servants of God, Christians, and to be welcomed in through the means of acceptance in the church as members, meaning baptized members, and also leaders in the church, while still, according to their own admission, by their own gospel and their own standards, struggling with temptation to the very sins that they, by the gospel, the Bible says, are to be cleansed, born again, and delivered from. Let's look at some scriptures very quickly. Look at the book of 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, very quickly. Let's look at some things very, very quickly. Very quickly, brothers and sisters. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, beginning with verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and beginning with verse 9. Notice the word of God teaching that these individuals that became Christians did not remain homosexuals. Did not remain murderers. Did not remain these various things. Or identify with these things. The gospel says they were past tense. But they are now something else. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Or even have church membership, brothers and sisters. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. That's one. That's, that covers everyone, doesn't it? Nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Let's get even more close now. Nor effeminate, how close can Paul get? Nor abuse them themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, both up there, nor inherit membership down here. They must be changed, it says in verse 10. It says in verse 10, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God, verse 11, and such were some of you. Is that past tense? They're not saying, I, oh, I'm a homosexuality, I'm just not practicing. No, it says you were these things. But ye are washed. Partially? Wow. What did Peter say? Oh, I can't be washed. Me? Oh, no, no. No, Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have nothing to do with me. He said, wash my head, wash my whole body then. And he did by the gospel. That foot washing was nothing. It was a symbol of what God does through the cleansing power of the word of God. It says here, such were, were some of you, but ye are washed. Put it in tense. But ye are Sanctified, present tense, but ye are justified, present tense, in the name of the Lord, that means his character, and by the Spirit of our God. our God. Brothers and sisters, these people were these things, but they were transformed. The issue is not that they are homosexual or effeminate or all these various things, or they had these sexual propensities. It is do they have access to the gospel that can give liberation to this? Are they hearing the true gospel that gives liberation? Because Everyone will struggle if they don't understand the way by which victory is attained. It's, it's elementary. And again, by the definition and by the declaration of this document, the composite of this document, do not understand the everlasting gospel. They don't understand what this true victory is. It seems like a, 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 fair, a miraculous thing. 